So, as Michelle mentioned, we have been having a workshop here as part of the Keck Institute during this week, and we've been looking at the challenging task of doing seismology on planets. Uh, some of the technical issues, some of the approaches are very similar to the successful techniques that have been developed for the sun and for the stars, so it seemed to me appropriate to invite someone who is one of the world's experts in that area. It's also, of course, an area that has famous Caltech connections. And so our speaker for this lecture is Laurent Guizon. Uh, he is a uh, director of a research group at the Max Planck Institute in Katlenberg Lindau. Not quite I don't have, oh yes, okay, that was, that was uh, politically not quite correct. Uh, but let's hope it's true. Uh, and uh, he is also a professor at Göttingen. And uh, his uh, undergraduate education was in France. He got a PhD in physics at Stanford. And he has been very actively involved in uh, a research program in uh, MHD and in helioseismology. And he's going to tell us today about the seismology of the sun and stars. Laurent. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, today I thought that I would uh, pick a particular topic. I will be telling you that the origin of the magnetic field in the sun and stars is not understood and that uh, the seismology of uh, stars can be used to put constraints on the uh, models for the dynamo. So first I thought that I should have a, a little uh, slide of introduction about the Sun. Uh, the Sun is a fairly uh, standard star in the sense that it is uh, a dwarf uh, star. G2 means it's yellow. Uh, it is middle-aged, 4.5 uh, billion years. And uh, it is slowly burning hydrogen on the main sequence in near hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, now, it, it is roughly representative of between 5% you know, and 25% of all stars on the, on the main sequence, depending on how you look at it. So energy is, is generated in the core and transported by radia radiation uh, in the uh, radiative zone, and then uh, by convection in the outer 30% by radius. Now, we do know a lot about the sun because it's so close and because, and because helioseismology can help us uh, see what is inside the sun. But there are certainly a lot of things that we do not know about the sun and solar-like stars in general. Obviously, we don't know that much about the early uh, stages of evolution. Why does the sun uh, have the mass that it has? Uh, and the late stages, uh, you know, the red, red giant phases and the, the later uh, stages of evolution. Uh, we, the, the, the theory of uh, energy transport by convection is uh, very much simplified in the models. And uh, there is a free parameter in, this, uh, in, the, in the theory that's, uh, uh, that needs to be um, uh, calibrated. Rotation, the rotation inside the sun, which has been uh, elucidated thanks to helioseismology, is not understood. The, the, the dependence as a function of uh, radius and, and uh, latitude. Mass loss is an important uh, phys uh, physical process because, essentially because it, it determines uh, the, the late stages of evolution. And we could go down the list of uh, you know, additional things that... Uh, would need uh, additional uh, understanding. But here, uh, during this lecture, I will try to focus on uh, magnetic activity, uh, the origin of the magnetic field of the sun and solar-like stars is not understood, as I said at the beginning. And not, so it's, it's important in itself, of course, but it's doubly important because uh, the magnetic field actually affects all these uh, phenomena Okay. So here is a, a, a little summary uh, uh, about the, uh, the solar cycle. 
the sun has a, a magnetic field and you're looking here at the photospheric magnetic field observed by the satellite SOHO. So uh, the, the white and black shades correspond to two different polarities of the magnetic field. And you see emerging uh, active regions. Uh, so these are active regions that, could in, that can include sunspots, for example. And this activity uh, slowly migrates towards the equator as the solar cycle uh, develops. Now the number of sunspots and active regions as a function of time uh, goes through a cycle of period 11 years. Uh, and if we take into account the, uh, the reversal of magnetic polarity from uh, uh, sunspot cycle to sunspot cycle, uh, there is a 22-year Hale ma magnetic cycle. Now, this periodicity of 11, 11 years is something that uh, was going on since, uh, you know, 1750. And uh, before that, there was a period uh, called the Mounda Minimum during which no sunspots were seen. How do we explain this? Uh, well, it's not understood, but it certainly tells us that the, the processes that give rise to the magnetic field have to be uh, nonlinear. If we look at stars that are quite similar to the sun, FGK, uh, some of them have magnetic cycle that are very similar to the sun's. Others have cycles that are much more irregular, and some show even uh, no activity. There are some basic properties that have been derived by looking at uh, sa a sample of stars, and I think these are the, the two main ones. Uh, the activity level is a function of age and rotation. Younger stars that rotate faster uh, are more active, and the cycle period increases with rotation period. Now, there are uh, various uh, models that exist for uh, the, uh, to explain stellar magnetic cycles. And mo most of them assume that there is a dynamo process that's taking uh, place in the star. Uh, I will here define the dynamo in a very, very simple way. Uh, and ba basically, I, I mean a flow that is capable of sustaining the magnetic field against uh, omic decay. Now, I, I'm not going to go through all these models. Uh, <laughs> impossible for me to do so anyway. Uh, but I do want to say that some of these models, for example, this one is called Alpha Omega Dynamo Wave Model, uh, has already been ruled out by helioseismology because it required that the rotation uh, inside the, the star uh, should increase with, uh, uh, as, as we go towards the center, yeah? And it's not the case. So, so you see, helioseismology can help already uh, rule out some models. Uh, and this, this actually led to the, uh, to, uh, the babcock lighten uh, dyna uh, dynamo model uh, to be sort of revived. And currently, the most popular model is the babcock lighten model where, that is advection, uh, where, where the flux, the magnetic flux, is transported by a flow, the manual circulation. And I want to summarize a little bit here what's happening uh, in this model. Uh, to, this is to help us understand, you know, why we're doing what we're doing in helioseismology. So uh, there are a number of steps in this dynamo model. First, the, uh, the toroidal field, so it's a field in the azimuthal direction, is uh, generated by differential rotation, latitudinal differential rotation, starting from a poloidal field. This is what you see here. Uh, because I remind you that the, uh, the equator of the sun uh, rotates faster than the poles and that this differential rotation persists throughout the whole of the convection zone. This has been observed by helioseismology. Uh, once we have a, a toroidal field like this, uh, and once a critical field strength is reached, an, an instability, a Parker instability, uh, sets in, and some, uh, some, some magnetic flux ropes or tubes may rise through, uh, through the convection zone due to magnetic buoyancy. 
Okay, this is what you see here. This is a loop that's uh, emerging. Uh, an important uh, process here is the, the effect of the Coriolis force on the tubes that, uh, that, tilts, that tilts the tubes in the north-south direction to give rise to a poloidal field component. Okay? And uh, so I should have said that when, when the tube uh, also um, uh, emerges at the surface, uh, this is where the, the sunspots and magnetic active regions can be, can be seen. Now, the rest of the process is uh, controlled very much in this, uh, in this uh, flux, transport, flux transport dynamo model by a meridional flow. So a flow from the equator to the poles. So it's, it's this, um, uh, this little uh, yellow uh, contour here. There is a flow in the sun from the equator to the poles and then presumably going uh, from the pole down. Near the surface, the amplitude of this flow is about 15 meters per second, very small. But in this model, it's uh, very important because it transports the flux from the equator to the poles and then down, down the convection zone and towards the equator again. And that, that last, uh, uh, th this transport from the, the polar region to the equator at the bottom of the convection zone is what gives rise to the the, the, uh, the motion of the, of the active regions towards the equator as is observed um, uh, at the surface. So, okay, and, and then so, and, and uh, at, at the end we, we end up with a, a polyidol field uh, component that's, that's reversed compared to the, to the beginning. So this whole thing is uh, ilinear. This is called, I should have said that the the, the, the first step is called the omega effect. And the, uh, the, the process of, of converting uh, toroidal into a poloidal field is called the alpha effect. So what is the, the promise of helioseismology and asteroseismology for understanding the dynamo? Well, given this, uh, this model I just described um, uh, very fast, it is clear that the way to go is to determine seismically uh, the solar cellar parameters that are relevant to the dynamo problem. And this means essentially the flows inside the stars. And then we would like to uh, establish relationships between internal structure and dynamics and the magnetic field. So it can be done by studying the sun, but the stars also, and not only, uh, but, but also the connections between the sun and the stars. So with helioseismology, we can measure differential rotation. This has been done, and I will show uh, an example. It, it was done uh, in the, you know, towards the, in the mid-80s, uh, and it's a, a very important result of helioseismology. Now, we're still looking for 11-year changes at the bottom of the convection zone because we're not even sure that uh, the, the seat of the dynamo is at the bottom of the convection zone. So if we could detect this, that would be very important. The manual circulation is something we want to measure, obviously, because of uh, what I just said. And uh, more generally, we would like to uh, map vector flows in three dimensions because uh, these, these flows uh, interact with the main field. And uh, it could, could, for example, provide the, uh, the alpha effect also. And if we could you know, see magnetic flux tubes rising through the convection zone, well, that would be a very nice clue too. So uh, that's something we want to try to do and to figure out what the, the subsurface structure of sunspots and magnetic, active region, and magnetic region is. For asteroseismology, the seismology of distant stars, uh, we first want to, to, to get improved stellar parameters, okay, because we don't know the radius, the mass, the the, you know, the bulk rotation of a star uh, to sufficient accuracy to be able to, to uh, really constrain the model. So, and, and in addition, we definitely want to, uh, if, if we can, we would like to learn about the gradients of rotation, the borders of convective zones, and anything that's related to uh, cycle, magnetic cycle changes uh, inside the stars. So to do that, we need to observe 
vibrations at the surface of the sun and stars. And here I want to uh, say very, very fast that uh, so something about solar-like oscillations. So these, these oscillations are uh, randomly excited by turbulent convection in the very near surface layers of a star. Uh, I'm talking here about stars that have a convective envelope like, like the sun. Uh, so that applies basically to uh, FGK stars, but also to red giants. The, the modes of oscillation that are excited are acoustic or pressure waves or P waves, uh, gravity modes may be excited too, but they have not been observed uh, convincingly. There are surface gravity waves. The, the restoring force is also gravity here. They are like ocean waves, uh, and they're called F modes. And in stars, we see mixed modes. So some, some, uh, some modes that have, you know, the character of uh, mixed character P and G. Uh, but for the sun, we, we essentially work with P modes and F modes also. So uh, now this, this each mode can be uh, described by um, a horizontal eigenfunction that's in the form of a spherical harmonics function, YLM of theta phi, where theta is a co-latitude phi, the longitude. Uh, there is a harmonic uh, dependence with time that's uh, and, and the, the frequency is omega NLM, okay? Where, so, so, so L is the harmonic degree, M the initial order, and N is the radial order, yeah? And this, this radial order corresponds to the number of nodes in the radial direction for the radial eigenfunction here that's called PLN of R. All right, so uh, for the sun, the, the frequencies are near uh, three millihertz, and uh, uh, so that, that's where we have maximum power. Now, the, the, the most important thing in, in all this is that different, different modes probe different regions in the, sun, in the sun or stars. And so if we measure the frequencies of the, of the modes of oscillations, uh, and if we make combinations of these, of these frequencies, we can get information about the interior of stars, information that's spatially resolved. So in a nutshell, I can't explain this in any detail, uh, the, the, the mode frequencies are sensitive to a number of, of parameters of, uh, of physical quantity, so most directly they are sensitive to the sound speed, since we're dealing with pressure waves, the density or some, uh, well, the density and some, uh, no, density or some other thermodynamic quantity. We can only take two, say so sound speed and density, sound speed and pressure, sound speed and first adiabatic exponent, for example. Uh, then uh, flows, so rotation, uh, yeah, mostly rotation here, and the magnetic field also. Uh, to first order, the mode frequencies are not sensitive to the meridional flow. Okay, this is due to the shape of the eigenfunctions. Uh, okay, or to north-south asymmetries. Now, global seismology consists of looking for a solar stellar model whose frequencies of oscillations are consistent with the observed frequencies. In asteroseismology, the seismology of stars, we need, well, what's being done is that grids of stellar evolution models are computed, and then the, uh, for, for each model, the frequencies are computed, and uh, uh, people are looking for the bet best match with the observations. In helioseismology, we have such a good reference model that we can actually linearize with respect to that model and solve a linear inverse problem to get to the information inside this, uh, the sun. For the sun, we have 10 to the 7 mode that have, that for which the frequencies are, are measured. And for stars, it's more, you know, a few tens of modes when we're lucky. So these are the two main results of uh, global helioseismology. On the left, the measurement of the sound speed as a function of radius in the star. Um, and on the right, the internal angular velocity. So the, the sound speed in the sun is about 500 uh, kilometers per second near the center and close, close to 10 kilometers per second near the surface. 
And, and here I'm actually not plotting the, the sound speed itself, but the deviations, the relative deviations of the squared sound speed with respect to uh, two different uh, solar models. Okay, that's why you have two curves, the blue and, and, and the red. For both these models, the, the agreement is within, uh, yeah, say 3% throughout the whole of the star, which is a, a remarkable achievement. Okay? Some of those are better than others. Uh, here, the difference between these two models is uh, different assumptions about the abundances. Yep. So we can still learn a lot about the physics uh, of, of, of the sun by uh, looking at different models. But, uh, and the error bars are, are teeny. Okay. Now for the rotation, the main uh, discovery is that the differential rotation persists throughout the whole of the convection zone. Okay while in the radiative interior it looks like we have rigid body rotation. So this was absolutely not expected before heliosismology made the measurements. Okay? A lot of people were saying we should expect rotation to go up as we go closer to the center. Um, uh, but yeah. Now, asteroseismology. So that's the seismology. We would like, as I said, to measure rotation and gradients and rotations in uh, other stars in the sun. And here I'm going to show you a very nice example of the seismology of a star. And this star is very interesting because it is not only solar-like, but it also has a known planetary companion that orbits around it. And that's why I, I propose these observations uh, to... Uh, uh, so so this, this star was observed by, by uh, the Koro satellite, which is an, an ESA uh, mission. And it turns out that these data I will show you are, I think, the, the best uh, available observations of oscillations on, of, of a solar-like star other than the sun. And, and in particular because not only it gives uh, constraints on the star but also on the planet. So this star is, is actually very close to the sun. This is the HR diagram. You have temperature uh, uh, increasing to the left on the x-axis and luminosity in increasing upward here. Uh, the sun is here, and this, the, the star I will, uh, I will show you results about is this uh, HD 52265 in red on this diagram. So it's very close to the sun in this HR diagram. And the only star that, that for which we have uh, seismic information that's, that's closer to the sun is actually Alpha Centauri. So it's a, it's a very good um, star to want to study. This is the power spectrum of oscillations of that star. So it was observed for uh, 117 days by Koro last year. And you're looking here at the modulus square of the Fourier transform of the, of the time series. And so I had to, to black out, okay, the, uh, well, it's not to whiten. <laughs> The, uh, the axes here, because these are not supposed to, uh, th these, these data are not public yet. Yeah? <laughs> but, yeah. So, but what is very clear here is that you have excess power uh, in some frequency range, <laughs> uh, and you see lots of peaks, yes? And if you zoom, uh, you actually see very, very clearly that uh, you, have, you have a peak here, well, you have, you have two peaks here, one here, two, one, etc. And, you know, anyone who does helioseismology recognizes immediately that these modes are the quadrupole modes, L equals two, this is L equals zero, radial modes, one, dipole modes, uh, etc. Okay? So you have this, this uh, pattern, two, zero, one, that repeats itself. Modulo, that large frequency separation, delta nu zero. I will not tell you what it is. <laughs> uh, there's also a separation here between the zero and the two. That's called small delta nu zero two. And these two quantities are very important because the large separation it corresponds to the sound travel time across the star, a stellar diameter. So it's, it's uh, very much, really, it's, it's essentially uh, proportional to the square root of density, average density of the star. So already it tells you, you know, something about the combination of mass and radius. The small separation 
uh, small delta nu is sensitive to the gradient, the radial gradient of sound speed in the very core of the star. And as a result, it tells us something about the age of the star, because as the star burns hydrogen into helium, uh, the chemical composition changes in the core of the star, and so you have access to the age of the star. To show you how good these data are, I'm comparing the observation, observation from the sun on the right and that star. Okay? So this diagram is a so-called Echelle diagram. The, the, the power spectrum was cut into chunks of delta nu zero, and then each, you know, the consecutive bits were piled up. Okay? So that if you have a periodicity, uh, it shows up as a line. In this, uh, in this kind of diagram. So, you know, they, they're, just, they're almost as good. <laughs> uh, the difference is that uh, the noise level is a bit higher here, yes? Uh, and that's because of uh, photon noise. We have less photons, of course. But it's, it's absolutely remarkable. And, and you can see, actually, that the number, the, the n values, the radio, so, so for each line here, it, it corresponds to a different uh, radial order. Okay, this is this number here, n. You see that the range of n that can be detected in that star is not that different from what can be detected in the sun. Okay. So it's, it's really good. And I think this data qualifies the best known data of uh, oscillation of sunlight cloud. That's not the sun. Now here's a quick um, analysis of the data which I cannot justify and I'm not allowed to justify in detail, but the point is that the radius of that star can be measured uh, by, you know, by, by fitting the, uh, a model to the uh, frequencies, and that radius is known, can, can be constrained to a precision of 0 0.017 solar radius. Uh, solar radius is 700 megameters, so th this is close to I don't know, uh, I think it's like t uh, 12, 12 uh, megameters. 12 megameters. This is the radius of the Earth, the, the, the diameter of the Earth. Yeah. So we can, we, we can get the, the, the radius of the star to a, a very good precision. And this is for an isolated star. Yeah. The mass also can be constrained very nicely. Okay. In general, we cannot... We cannot uh, it's very hard to know anything about the mass of an isolated star. Usually it takes you know, uh, uh, multiple systems of stars to, uh, to, to learn about the mass. And the age can also be constrained here within uh, about 300 million years, which doesn't seem maybe so Im impressive, but it's, it's at least three times better than what you would do without seismology. Now these numbers depend a lot on, on the uh, initial chemical composition that you use uh, for the models, and uh, you, can, you can get an idea by uh, doing spectroscopy on the star. Now, what is even more remarkable is that we can actually measure rotation in this star. So, rotational frequencies, the rotational frequency splitting is m omega. Um, so, m, I remind you, m is the uh, azimuthal order, yeah? And the spherical harmonics are proportional to Ea exponential I am phi, where phi is longitude. Uh, when you put in rotation, the, the azimuthal orders are going to be to have a different frequency. Modes that uh, propagate in the prograde direction have a higher frequency than modes that propagate against rotation. Yeah? And so, by measuring this splitting between the different azimuthal components, we can get to rotation. And that's what is done here. So, for, for L equals zero, of course, there's only one, uh, one mode, so you can't expect any splitting. But for L equals one, the dipole modes, uh, you're going to get uh, three different uh, uh, azimuthal components that are split by, by uh, a value of... Uh, Omega, where omega is the angular velocity of the star. Okay? And for L equals 2, you would have five, five modes, because M goes between minus L and plus L. So here what you can see even by I is that you know, the width of this peak here is bigger 
than the width of L equals zero. So we can actually measure rotation. Now the answer is not, it's not so simple because the visibility of the azimuthal modes depends on the angle between the line of sight and the direction of the, uh, the spin axis of the star. Okay? So when we, when we do a fit like this, what, what the fit returns is uh, two values, the, the, the sine i and the omega. And, and here, the, the, these are the values of the fit. So the, the values are shown here in this plot. Ooh, what time is it? Uh, I have no idea. Eh? I have a lot more to say. So. <laughs> well, okay, good. Um, okay, so, so here on, the, on this plot, I have on the x-axis the sine i, where i is the inclination of the rotation axis to the line of sight. And omega is the angular velocity of the star in units of the solar angular velocity. This omega is an average over the star. Okay. So the seismic constraint is in red here, one sigma. And the two sigma is, uh, is in uh, light, uh, light red. That's the seismology constraint that we obtain. Now, this, this dot here is what my uh, PhD student uh, got. <laughs> uh, I worked with him, but th this, is, uh, this is what uh, we, we figured out. And the other, the other points here are coming from other teams that uh, studied this star also. So it's, it's, it's quite uh, encouraging that a lot of, I mean, when you look at it, uh, you know, people essentially agree with what the answer <laughs> is. Now, there are other constraints that we can get from, for example, the, rot the rotation of the star spots that affects the light curves. There, is, there are periodicities in the, in the photometric light curves that are caused by the rotation of star spots. And there are two peaks at low frequencies in the power spectrum that are given by these two horizontal lines here. So this is very much consistent with at least the, this, this point here. Um, there's another constraint to check for consistency. What we can do is measure the V sine i of the star, okay, where V is the rotational velocity, and divide by the seismic determination of radius. So if you divide V sine i by R, you essentially get omega sine i. So you, can, so you get a constraint in this plane, omega sine i. And that constraint is given by the blue, uh, the blue curves here. Uh, so, th these are one sigma um, constraints. So, this is absolutely remarkable. <laughs> uh, the, the V sine i and the seismology constraints are almost exactly the same in that region here. Okay? So, it's very nice consistency. Above, uh, it's different because uh, the seismology actually tells us that uh, for, for low values, of, uh, of sine i, you, c you cannot have, um, uh, it's, uh, low values of sine i are not possible. Okay? Um, and so if you look at all this taken together, it's very clear that you know, the, the rotation of the star can be measured with a very good um, um, uh, precision. And here, it's, so it's of the order of, uh, I don't know, uh, 2.4, say. Uh, and, um, solar angular velocity, okay? And the sine i can also be constrained if you, if you take into account the star spot constraint and the seismic constraint, you can do a good job at getting a constraint on the sine i. Now, the, I said that there was a, a planet orbiting that star, and this planet was uh, detected by uh, Butler et al., 2006, using a radial velocity measurement technique. And when people detect uh, planets using the radial velocity technique, what they obtain is not the mass of the planet, but the mass of the planet, mp, times the, the, the sine of ip, where ip is the inclination of the normal to the uh, orbital plane of the planet uh, uh, with respect to the line of sight. Yes? 
this is all you can do with, uh, with the radial velocity technique. So, see, if you say, if you assume, like it's basically the case for our solar system, that I and IP are the same, you can actually constrain the mass of the planet. And that's what is shown at the top of this plot here. Okay, what was plotted here is mass of the planet times sine IP divided by mass of Jupiter sine I. So if IP and I are the same, what you read here with these numbers uh, is the mass of the planet in units of Jupiter masses. Okay? So we can say that the mass of the planet is within uh, 1.4 or 2.2 Jupiter masses if we assume that I equals IP. That's an interesting thing that, you know, looking at oscillations of the star, you can tell something about the mass of a planet. And, uh, in fact, it, it, it confirms that it's a planet because uh, before we had, we had only this M sine IP and it was not excluded that uh, this uh, companion could have been a brown dwarf, okay, with, with a mass uh, above certain Jupiter masses because we didn't know sine I, okay? So this, this probably confirms that it's a planet. Of course, uh, well, okay, fine. Now I want to talk to you about something completely different, which is local helioseismology. So now we go back to the sun, and I will show you how we can infer information about the inside of the sun in three dimensions. So local helioseismology is a set of techniques that are based on the interpretation of the full wave field at the, at, the, at the surface of the sun. Well, at least the line of sight component of velocity at, at the surface of the sun. So it's, it does not try to just interpret the frequencies of the modes, but it also uh, cares about the eigenfunctions, if you like. Or if you like, about the phases of the waves, about the amplitudes of the waves. Um, and with these techniques, we can study a number of topics that cannot be studied with global mode helioseismology. Yes? So we can look at, uh, first of all, we have uh, you know, three-dimensional uh, access to the three-dimensional three uh, uh, structure, uh, structures inside the star, so we can study uh, sunspots and active regions. Uh, we can also look at uh, flows in the north-south direction, the manual flow, which we could not get with uh, global mode seismology. And we can even look at the far side of the sun. Uh, we can actually focus the waves, uh, uh, the far side of the sun, to detect active regions on the far side of the sun. This is one application. I will talk to you about this time-distance helioseismology, which is uh, called uh, noise tomography in, size, in geo seismology. So first, the input data is this uh, panel C at the bottom left here the Doppler grams observed by the satellite SOHO, one every minute, uh, about two to three months every year for the last 14 years. Okay? Excellent observations. And what you're looking at here, uh, so, so the blue and the, and the yellow tell you, uh, you know, it's, it's a line of sight component of velocity. And in the middle here, you have a little sunspot. Uh, so we have a very good resolution. The size of a sunspot, the diameter is about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 20, uh, 20 megameter radius for, the, for the, the radius of the penumbra. So it tells you how good we're doing here. Now, if you take a three-dimensional Fourier transform of that data cube, so x, y, and t, and if you average over the direction of the waves, the horizontal direction of the waves, you get, actually this was not average, no. This is a cut at ky equals zero. So you have the uh, wave number kx in the, uh, in the, in the x direction yeah, versus the temporal frequency here at ky equals zero. And so you see all these ridges that, that come, that, that, that are visible. The first ridge at lower frequencies is the F modes, the ocean waves, if you like. And all the other ridges are for the acoustic waves. So basically, you know, the, 
if you if you if you think of the uh, of a line go that goes through zero, uh, that's a line omega of a k equals constant, okay, constant phase speed, horizontal phase speed. When you increase the horizontal phase speed, so you go towards the the vertical axis, you probe deeper layers inside the sun, and that's because the sound speed increases fast um, within the star inside the star. So time distance seismology consists of taking the Doppler velocity phi at two different points, A and B, at the surface, A and B, and doing a temporal cross-correlation. Okay? This function is called C. And what this function tells us is how fast wave packets propagate from A to B or B to A. Yeah? Uh, the travel times can be extracted from the two branches of the cross-correlation. And here you have a plot of this cross-correlation function uh, as a function of the distance between the points A and B on the x-axis and the time like t. Okay? The time like t here is a shift in time uh, that you apply to the signal at B. And so you should look here at the gray, the gray scale. And what you see are these, these oscillations here. Uh, along a ridge here. These are first arrival uh, correlations. And they correspond to waves that go, you know, that do one skip between A and B. And then you have other ridges, like the one in red here, uh, that correspond to waves that, that, that skip once in between A and B. So what, what we usually use only are the first arrival uh, uh, cross correlations. And so you can measure from this, uh, this cross-correlation the arrival time or the travel times uh, of the waves on the, on the left axis for a given distance. Yeah? So we can, we, in principle, we can measure the travel times for any pair of points on the surface of the sun and then, and then solve an inverse problem to get to the information in the sun. To get to that information, we need a relationship between the travel times, the travel time perturbations, and perturbations in the physical quantities inside the sun. And this relationship is given by travel time sensitivity kernels, which are three-dimensional uh, sensi sensitivity functions. Uh, I just want to, to show you that because it's, it's actually a major uh, effort to compute these functions. Uh, here you sh you're looking at a kernel for uh, sound speed perturbations in the sun. So we solve, once we have this function, we solve an inverse problem. And an example of what we can get here are convective flows in three dimensions, vector flows in three dimensions in the sun, in the upper layers. Because flows affect travel times. Waves that propagate along the flow go faster than waves that go against the flow. Yeah. So here's a, a result of an inversion on the x-axis. So this is x and y on the sun at a depth of about uh, one megameter. I remind you that the radius of the sun is 700 megameters, so it's very close to the surface. But the, what you can see, so the red, the red colors uh, correspond to an upflow. Okay. It's very small. It's a few tens of meters per second. It's very hard to measure, but, but it's possible. And then the, the little arrows tell you about the horizontal components of the flow, the x and the y. Okay. And we can uh, also look at cuts uh, at, uh, at constant y along this white line here to get uh, the answer as a function of z on the y-axis here and x. So for different uh, layers and depths, you can look at how the, the flows look like. And here, for example, you see um, a red uh, stripe all along it, that corresponds to, um, to a, a collimated uh, upflow throughout this whole layer that's uh, five megameters. So here we're looking at convection, okay? And we are looking very, I mean, the main signal in these maps corresponds to a scale of 30 megameters. That's called supergranulation. 
you have here, for example, a big super granule. It's, it's a bit bigger than, than usual, but, and, and it's close to a sunspot here. We can see very clearly that the flows, well, I, I should say that here, the colors uh, have a completely different meaning. The colors show, uh, tell you about the magnetic field seen at the surface of the sun. So we can look at the relationship between the flows and the magnetic field. And you can see here that there is no magnetic field inside that supergranule. That's because the, the flows that, that are of the order of, uh, say, 150 meters per second uh, carry the magnetic field uh, you know, along the borders of the supergranules. So it's a very nice match between the dynamics and the magnetic field. Now, there are some mysteries still about uh, supergranulation. So here, this is a much bigger map uh, on the sun. Uh, every white uh, little blob here corresponds to one supergranule, so 30 megameters. OK, I'm late. OK. Um, <laughs> yeah, every, every blob here corresponds to one supergranule of 30 megameters. So it's a lot of supergranules here. And you have uh, a movie that plays that shows how um, this pattern uh, evolves with time. Uh, in fact, white corresponds to an outflow. Yeah. Um, and what was, uh, what was seen uh, not so long ago is that the, the motion of the pattern of convection is faster than rotation. So that there may be a, 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 a traveling wave component to the convection, but it's not explained yet. Uh, I, should, I, I don't have time, but I will just say that if we average uh, spatially, we can actually detect the effect of rotation and convection, the, the effect of the Coriolis force on the flows. Okay? For example, in the north, when you have an inflow, on average, you have uh, a circulation that's uh, counterclockwise. This is what's expected from the effect of the Coriolis force on the flows. It's a teeny effect. It's a few percent, but it's... it's, it's and this was not discovered by uh, any other method than helioseismology. Uh, this could have an effect on, uh, but it, it could twist the toroidal field to, to give this uh, polyidal component, the alpha effect. So it's um, maybe of, of use. Uh, very fast, I would say that, uh, I, I would like to say that we can measure the flows from the equator to the poles near the surface, this 15 meters per second flow. That's so important in flux transport dynamo models. Now, what we discovered is that the, the meridional flow changes with time. And here you have residuals of the meridional flow as a function of time. Time is the x-axis. Yeah? So the first, uh, it goes up to 2000 and, uh, and uh, what is it, six maybe, yeah? And uh, everything that's above is extrapolated just for us to, to see better. But, uh, so, so red means that there's a, a bit of, of extra, meridional, there's a residual meridional circulation with respect to the time average uh, in the, in the, towards the pole. Yeah? And here, blue, it's uh, towards the equator. The, the dark line here is the location of the active regions on the sun, okay? The active regions, they start at the beginning of the cycle from the high latitude, and then they slowly move towards the equator. So there is a little, there is a component of motion that's towards the active regions. And uh, so that was discovered by Helioseismology, and if you actually don't average of a, of a um, azimuth, you can see that um, uh, if you look um, around the active regions, you will see some very small flows, 50 meters per second, that converge towards the active regions. So that could be at the origin of the time variation of the meridional circulation. And in the end, it could be important because that could seriously affect the latitudinal transport of the magnetic field because this time varying, this time varying component of the meridional flow is of the order of plus minus five meters per second. So compared to 15, it's, it's very big. Okay, just uh, very fast. So sunspot seismology, what we would like to see is what this uh, PR movie from NASA is, is showing you. This, this flux tubes that rise through the convection zone and, and pierce the surface to, see the, to, to uh, give rise to the sunspots. Yeah? 
And uh, because hopefully we, uh, you know, if we could learn something about the subsurface st uh, structure of sunspot, we could get a link between the surface and the deep seated dynamo. Now to, solve, to do seismology with this kind of problem is very difficult because we cannot linearize with respect to the quiet sun model, to the quiet sun reference model because in sunspots, perturbations are big, okay? Density is much lower and pressure is much lower, gas pressure. So we have to use numerical simulations. And this is what I'm, uh, I'm, I'm showing here. Uh, I don't think I, I will have a lot. <laughs> I, I can't explain this. Uh, I don't have enough time to explain this, but uh, so uh, let's say, so here you have uh, Y on the sun and X. Here you have a sunspot. The, the, the red uh, circles show you the boundary of the umbra and the penumbra of the sunspot. Now, uh, at the bottom, you have the cross correlation and it's a movie that's obtained by each frame corresponds to a different value of the correlation time lag that I talked to you about before. Now, this cross-correlation was obtained by cross-correlating the signal averaged over a line. That's, if you follow the pointer, that's here, and any other point in the map. And by doing that, you essentially look at the wave packet that propagates from that line uh, towards the right, because you select wave numbers in the x direction. At the top, you have a comparison with a simulation of wave propagation through a sunspot model. Okay, and you can do that because there's a, a famous theorem, a theorem that's now famous, that uh, tells us that the cross correlation is essentially related to the Green's function. And so we can, we can do this calculation. And this, is, this particular calculation is, uh, yeah, is for P1 modes, okay? And at the bottom, you see what happens to the P1 modes, modes as they go through the sunspot in the ZX plane. What you see is that these modes, they convert into slow magnetoacoustic waves that propagate down the sunspot um, and affect the cross-correlation as seen at the surface. And these, these slow magnetoacoustic waves, they, so they extract energy, and so the, the amplitude of the cross correlation is, um, is reduced, and the, 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 the waves are also phase shifted. They go faster as they propagate through the sunspot. So now we have some very good models of sunspots that actually provide a very good match between the observations um, and the simulations. And our hope is that we will be able soon to linearize with respect to these model sunspots to do standard uh, uh, local helioseismology, um, but I mean, not quite standard, but, but with respect to that model sunspot to refine the answer. Okay, we skip that, this also. <laughs> and I just want to tell you that uh, Helioseismology and astroseismology is a very uh, active field of research that there are lots of missions that are going on and that are planned. For helioseismology, there is the Solar Dynamics Observatory of NASA that was launched this February. It will operate for uh, 10 years and um, it's an important mission. Uh, then a bit later, there will be Solar Orbiter uh, from ESA they will uh, look, from, uh, look at the sun uh, outside of the ecliptic to have a view of the poles. In asteroseismology, we have these missions Koro and Kepler that are currently taking data on uh, a, a, few, a few stars. A few, let's say Kepler up to 100 stars uh, will be observed for a very long, long uh, time for the seismology. Song is a possibility that would be a ground-based network of um, telescopes that would, so about, you know, between six and eight stations around the world that would observe oscillations of stars, solar-like stars. And it's, it's essentially a, a copy of the GONG project of NSF that's observing the sun uh, continuously, but for stars. And then Plato, which would, uh, which would be, uh, you know, starting in 2017, if everything goes well, 
uh, that will observe many stars in oscillations. So uh, just uh, very quickly, SDO, the advantage of SDO is the increased resolution of the Dopplergrams. Now we will have images that are 4K by 4K, okay? The whole sun, and every 40 or 45 uh, seconds, there will be an image, Doppler image, that will be taken uh, of, of the sun. And this increased resolution, uh, wh what it does is that it, gi it gives us an, uh, an increased resolution projected uh, on the sun closer to the limb, which means that we can extend uh, helioseismology uh, closer to the limb, in, and including in high, in high latitudes. Okay. Solar orbiter, we look at the sun from uh, a heliographic latitude of up to 35 degrees. Okay. There would be uh, uh, the, the planet uh, is uh, Venus flybys to uh, to, uh, to, to kick off the satellite uh, of the plane of the ecliptic. And uh, so here, the idea is to try to do local helioseismology of the polar regions, which we cannot do now. And it is especially try to measure meridional circulation um, near the poles. Plato is a very exciting mission. Um, that's, uh, it's driven by uh, the discovery of planets. Uh, but uh, seismology is a very important component of that mission too. And in fact, it means planetary transits and oscillations of stars. So, it, you know, the goal is to detect uh, planetary transits, but not only to detect them, but to characterize the planets through the seismology of the planet host stars. This is a, a new concept because people have realized that you cannot know, you will not, never know enough about the planets if you don't know enough about the stars. And here to, to illustrate this, it's, you know, it's very clear. You, from the, the, from the uh, transit data, you can only get the ratio of the planetary radius to the, st to the stellar radius. If you, if you get the data from Gaia and the seismology of the central star, you can get the radius of the star with high precision. And that will give you, in turn, the radius of the planet. And the same from the, for the mass of the planet, uh, which you have to get, uh, you, which you'll be getting from um, uh, follow-up ground-based observations uh, in spectroscopy. And that's known only uh, as a function of the radius of the mass of the planet to the mass of the star. Seismology, as I showed, can give you the mass of the star. So you get the mass of the planet. And the age of the planet can be deduced from the age of the star. If you get this information for a large number of systems, you can study the evolution of planetary systems. Okay? And the plan is actually to observe, to do the seismology of up to 30,000 uh, bright dwarfs. Bright means with magnitude less than 11. Okay? So this, this would be a revolution. <laughs> We can do the seismology that I showed you with 30,000 stars. Kepler, it's going to be you know, close to 100 or something, which will be observed for a very long time. Uh, 30,000 stars. And um, OK, so, so uh, this is a very exciting mission. And uh, what I should say is that now in these two missions, Solar Orbiter and Plato, are uh, M-class ESA missions. And there are two out of three. Uh, well, sorry, currently there are three missions in the M class um, that uh, are going through a definition phase, and at the end they will select uh, two missions out of the three. So at least one of these two will be selected, and we hope that both will be. <laughs> seismology, so, so, so to summarize, with the seismology of the sun and stars, we should be able to say something about dynamo models to explain the origin of magnetic fields in stars. And the idea is to measure flows in the sun, three-dimensional fl uh, flows, as well as flux emergence and cycle variations at the bottom of the, of the convection zone. For stars, we want to figure out what the statistical relationships are between 
internal uh, structural uh, parameters and rotation and activity. Okay? Of course, there are many other applications of uh, seismology. I focused on this uh, stellar activity uh, topic, um, also in part because uh, Lighton uh, was here. <laughs> um, but uh, obviously, you can, you know, in, 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 in very general terms, you can say that asteroseismology and, and helioseismology taken all together will help us test and refine the theory, the general theory of stellar structure and evolution. Uh, we're in particular, if we know about the age of stars and their initial chemical, chemical composition, you can say something about the age and the chemical evolution of the galaxy. And planet host stars can help us characterize physically exoplanets. Not only can help us, but it's probably the only way to do it. The seismology of solar analogs is a very interesting topic also. So the idea here is to study uh, stars that look like, that are very close to the sun, because we would like to know if the sun is a special sun-like star or not. <laughs> and that's, a, that's an interesting topic. That is, is the sun in the middle of the distribution of all the stars that, in principle, cannot be distinguished from the, from, from the, from the sun? Do they all have the same rotation for the same age? Do they all have the same magnetic field for the same age, the same rotation? We don't know. And uh, so to summarize, this is, a, a very, this is really an exploding field of research, very exciting, that's supported by uh, a lot of very expensive uh, space projects. And um, so, uh, you know, if you want to work in this field, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, if you want a summary of uh, some of this, you can go to annual, annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, I have a paper that's coming uh, uh, this year. Yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs>